Well, good morning. Pastor, have a seat. Ugh, some people, man, they're just not organized enough around here. Is that the camera that's streaming to the back room? Or is it up there? It's up there? Listen, that's going to the internet, and that one's going to the back room. Fantastic. Hey, back room, glad to see you. Glad that you're here this morning as well. You know what? I think I'm going to go put my face mask on and join you after announcements, okay? Because I want to experience the whole thing that we have going on at church. You know, we've got some stuff going on that uh, some people are more comfortable than others to be in the sanctuary where we uh, worship and masks are optional. And then uh, we have others who would like to wear their mask and we have a separate place for them to meet and worship God as well. We are here as a body because we want to encourage everybody uh, in Jesus Christ, okay? Uh, scary times that we're going through. A lot of people, uh, and, and Will had a great Sunday school lesson on it. Um, you know, we worry about so many things. While his was specifically about finances today, we do worry about these kinds of things as well. And we can't. We can't worry because worry is a sin and God's in charge. We do what we need to do. We do what we have to do. And that's why we're providing services out there in the fellowship hall as well as in here because we want to meet together as Christians to worship Jesus Christ. And he is in charge. And I'm going to say it. He's large and in charge, right? Kind of like Pastor John here, large and in charge. If you were to stand next to me, the guy's kind of, oh, yeah. He can grow a beard in like three days, and I, I'm, I might take three years to get to his point. But anyhow, if you are a first-time guest at our church, please do not let my announcements uh, gauge your p thoughts and opinions about the church. Wait till the preacher preaches, and then you can do that, okay? But if you are a first-time guest... We have out in the fellowship hall a table with some paperwork and things for you. If you would like to fill out a connection card out there, go up, just feel free to walk up there and grab one, fill it out, and we'll send you some more information about our church. Here in the sanctuary, in the pews, we have the same card. Feel free to fill that out if you would like some more information as well. I think, uh, yeah, we all look fairly familiar to me today. So, but if you would like that information, feel free to do so. We also have on the back side of that card a uh, prayer card. And you can put those in the offering plate. We have a team in the pastor's study today who will be praying for the cards that came in last week and for all of your requests. We also have prayer meeting at 7 o'clock on Wednesday, and we pray for those as well. I mean, uh, prayer should be a priority for us right now, especially as a body of believers and especially during these times. How do we conduct our lives in a way that, well, that don't broadcast worry but at the same time broadcast grace uh, broadcast Jesus Christ because the gospel of Christ is the primary thing right now and should be our focus but prayer we have a lot going on and God is concerned and wants to hear from you and we pray for our benefit right we pray for our benefit because God changes us through our prayer lives and so we need to be doing those things so if you have a concern anything you want to praise the Lord for anything you want us to pray for put it on the in the uh, plate at the back in the fellowship hall or in the plate in the, uh, not the fellowship hall, the foyer and the fellowship hall. Okay, I'm going to move forward. I've got, only got a couple of announcements. This Saturday is men's breakfast, and it's always got lots of bacon, and that's at 8 o'clock Saturday. We'll be meeting in the fellowship hall there. I don't know what we're studying now because we've had a long break, uh, but that's Saturday at 8 o'clock if you would like to come to that, and we'll open up. God's Word, we'll fellowship around food, and we'll have a good time. That's this Saturday. Also, there's an insert. It's um, a buff color, I think, in your bulletin. It's for Baptism Sunday. We have been blessed by our Lord who has opened up the campground to us this year to uh, go ahead and have our service like we normally do on the third Sunday of August, which will be August 16. We'll baptize people in the river. Actually, we'll have a service, baptize people in the river, and then we're going to do what Baptists do well. We're going to eat, right? And so, but it's not about that, is it, Pastor? It's not about the food. It's about the baptism, and we have a good time down there. So if you would like to be baptized, fill this card out or contact the church office, and we'll put you on the list. Pastor John or Pastor Chris will reach out to you and talk to you about uh, what the significance of that is to make sure that you understand exactly what you're doing. So that's it for announcements. I do have to talk about our missionary of the week. That is last week's. This week is Nika. 
and I'm not going to try to pronounce the last name. Uh, we have a couple of pastors in the, in the country of Georgia over in, in uh, the Russian area. What, what, what continent is that? Europe? Asia? It's Asia? I don't know. It's over there on the other side of the world. And uh, near Georgia, okay? And actually it is in Georgia. But we have a couple of pastors there that we support as a church. And his name is Nika. I'm not going to try with the last name. There are some letters back underneath the TV if you would like to pull one with updates on them. And uh, they're doing a lot of really good things over there. He says in his most recent letter that they have a lot of Muslims living in their area. And that's a specific focus of ministry for them. And, but it's been very difficult because of uh, their mountain villages and things. And uh, the v regions are very difficult to reach for the Lord. People perceive the words of God very hard is what he says. But we do not give up and we continue to testify about Christ. Uh, they work through Christians who already live there, and they invite them, their friends and neighbors into their homes. And he talks about a woman who uh, had attended several meetings at one time, but unfortunately her family rebelled and drove her out of the house. Uh, she became ill. It doesn't say what it was with, but she went into the hospital, and she continues to use her faith in Christ to testify and to be a testimony there. And they also have another family in a village there that they're ministering to, and in the beginning, her family members were also opposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ and the preaching of the word. But after two meetings, okay, after two meetings, the husband and children repented and started visiting the local church. And their group has formed itself as a result of their, their activity, Nika's activity as missionaries. And that group currently consist, consists of 10 people, and God is doing a work there and God has blessed the work that they're doing. And so through our support and through your prayer, God is doing wonders around this world. And only God can change the heart of men, right? And that's why we worship and praise him, because he's changed our hearts. Where would we be? We'd be desperate people without him. And so uh, uh, pray for Nika and his ministry as a pastor there. Very difficult atmosphere to be ministering into. And, but God is doing a movement, and God is doing a work, because God is greater than anything that would oppose him including satan and so we just want to praise the lord for that pastor john we're going to have you come up and continue with announcements and thank you chris thank you band listen right now children are dismissed to children's church all children are are headed that way and as they make their way please look to the screen Hopefully. In Psalms chapter 146, verses 2 through 3, it says, Put not your trust in princes, in a, in a son of man, in whom there is not salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Princes here is a reference to, to rulers, you could say the leader of the day, you could say the government. That's saying when you and I are looking for someone to put our hope in, for someone to trust in, someone that's in control, will keep their word, will save us. The ruler of the day, the government, is not the answer. The ruler of the day and the government, they come and go, and as this text says, their plans will perish. Let me say it this way. The upcoming election is important. It is very important. But that is telling me that my hope, my trust, is not in a certain candidate who will be here one day and gone the next. Who can we trust for direction and saving? It is not the upcoming president it is not the government the governments that so often come and go proverbs chapter 18 verse 3 says if one gives an answer before he hears it is his folly and shame proverbs 18 7 says the one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him what does that remind you of 
For me, that reminds me of the media. The media is all about getting out the story first instead of getting the story right. And as a result, we have a bunch of folly and shame that come our way that we have to delineate, dive into, and discern. And the media, at first, is always very convincing. They're good at what they do, so they're very convincing. They seem right at first until you utilize a few brain cells or check the other side of the story. So who can we trust? Who is faithful and who can we depend on? Not the next ruler, not the media that does that. Who can we trust? Proverbs 17.5 says, Cur- says, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength. In other words, humanity with all its technology and ingenuity will let you down. Humanity is limited and broken. So who can we look to today that never fails, always keeps their word, is actually mighty to save? Mark chapter 7, verses 21 and 22, Jesus says, For from within the heart, the hearts of men, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, debauchery, envy, slander, arrogance, and foolishness. In other words, the whole idea of looking to yourself or following your heart or trusting in your own heart is a dangerous joke. Our own hearts have a tendency to lead us astray. And we know that. We've all been so convinced of something, so convinced of something, only to find out that we're totally wrong and totally headed in the wrong direction. So who can we trust? Who is 100% in control, 100% keeps their word, 100% capable of saving us? We need to know that today. And the Bible makes it clear. Isaiah 26, 4 says, Trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord God is an everlasting rock. Psalm 37, 5-7, Trust in the Lord. Delight yourself in the Lord. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust Him and He will act. Zephaniah 3, 7, telling The Lord your God is among you. He is mighty to save. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, you know it. Let's read it together. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make your paths straight. Who can we trust? Who can we look to that's 100% in control, always keeps their word, always follows through, always wins? Who is it? It's not the upcoming president. It's not mankind or any technology that we develop. It's not ourselves. It is the Lord God Almighty. Amen? Amen. That is who we trust in. That is who we trust in. The trouble is most people don't believe that. Many have tried God out only to think that he's a failure and a scam. Brad Pitt was raised by two Baptists, and in a press conference he said, many people find religion to be very inspiring. Myself, I found it very stifling. I grew up with Christianity, and I remember questioning it greatly. I grew up being told God is going to take care of everything, and it didn't work out that way. Rhett and Link are two YouTubers with over 16.5 million subscribers, and they tried God out, and they said he didn't satisfy, he wasn't valid, and he wasn't trustworthy. Joshua Harris has written many Christian books, and now he's disillusioned with God and has declared God and his word untrustworthy. And if we're honest, sometimes I think we have to admit that we find God hard to trust. And today, in Romans chapter 11, we're going to see, we're going to be reminded of almost an entire people group. Almost an entire people group that thought, if Jesus is true, then God's a liar and he's untrustworthy. We're going to see a people group that thought God was untrustworthy as a result of the work of Jesus. 
But we're also going to see in Romans chapter 11, Paul set the record straight. That God is the one who is trustworthy. That God is the one that we can look to in all things. In all things, with all our heart, soul, and mind. That He is trustworthy. Amen? Amen. If you haven't already, please turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 11. And we're going to be beginning in verse 1. Romans chapter 11, verse 1 we see that God is trustworthy. Verse 1 starts saying, I ask then, has God rejected His people? Throughout the Old Testament, God made promises to His people. This is a reference to the Jews. He made conditional promises to the Jews. God said, I will do this if you do this. Those are conditional promises. But He also made unconditional promises of salvation To the Jews, in Psalm 94, he said to the Jews, I will not abandon you. I will neither leave you or forsake you. Never, no condition, unconditional promise to the Jews. In Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 33, God said to the nation of Israel concerning salvation, concerning Jesus, a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, I will put my law within them and on their heart I will write it and I will be their God and they shall be my people. If you turn to Psalm 105, you will see a psalm that is dedicated to giving thanks to God for all of his unconditional promises to the nation of Israel, to the Jews. But in Paul's day, like today, the majority of the Jews rejected Jesus. They did not believe in Jesus Christ. And as a result, the Jews saw all that. They saw that the majority of Jews did not believe in Jesus Christ. So they were so confused and so bewildered and thought God was untrustworthy because he had made all of these unconditional promises to the nation of Israel, to the Jews, Yet when the supposed Savior that's supposed to save them comes along named Jesus, the majority do not believe. They're not saved. And the ultimate consequence of that is hell. Like, how how does that work? How can you have unconditional promises of salvation, yet the majority of the people you're promising this to not saved? How does that work? And the only conclusion they could come to was God isn't trustworthy. If Jesus is true, God is not trustworthy. He has broken his unconditional promises. He has rejected his people. And what is Paul's answer to that? For two chapters, actually, for chapters 9 and 10, we've seen that he's been saying, no, 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 no! <laughs> Say no! No, just because the majority of Jews reject Jesus does not mean he's broken all of his unconditional promises to the Jews. No. And today he says the same thing in Romans 11. He's saying God is trustworthy. Has God rejected his people? By no means. He utilizes again for the 10th time in Romans the strongest Greek language to say no. To say no. The fact that most of the Jews rejected Jesus at this time, like today, does not mean that God has broken his promises to the Jews. It does not mean he has completely rejected them. It does not mean that. And then after Paul says, no, what does he do? He doesn't just throw the tantrum and stomp his leg like I just did. He proves it. He proves it. He utilizes in this passage, as we're going to see, He's going to utilize three testimonies to prove that despite the majority of the Jews rejecting Jesus, that God has not reneged, that God has not broken any of his promises. He is the Lord God Almighty who is always true. He's going to utilize three testimonies. He's going to utilize the testimony of Paul, he's going to utilize the testimony of Elijah, and he's going to utilize the testimony of prophecy to say, no, God is trustworthy. Let me prove it to you. So let's look at his own personal testimony first. Look at verse 1 again. 
I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. For I myself am an, am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. Paul is saying, hello, I, the person who's writing this, is a Jew, and I have been saved by God through his grace, through belief in Jesus Christ. He's saying, just, he's saying, just like God said, God has provided salvations for, salvation for the Jews to receive and enjoy, and I'm living proof of that. How can you say God has rejected the Jews when I am a Jew who is saved? It's because God has not rejected them. It's because God is trustworthy. It's because God does keep his promises. And then he moves from this personal testimony and he dives into the testimony of Elijah to prove that God is trustworthy. Look at verse 2. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah? How he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have demolished your altars. And I alone am left and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at this present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. During the days of Elijah, the overwhelming, in the Old Testament, the overwhelming majority of the Jews rejected God and were worshiping a false god, as this text says, named Baal. And that was going on so much, it was such an overwhelming majority that Elijah, at one point in his ministry, after he has a great victory over Baal, over Baal with these seven or 500 prophets that he defeats, he's on the run, and he's in a cave, and he's throwing this pity party, saying, I am the only one left. I'm the only one in the whole entire nation of Israel that actually believes and follows you, God. And what does God say to him? He says, as the text says, no, 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 no. Get over yourself. You're not the only one. No, I have kept for myself 7,000 who do not reject me, who do not follow Baal, but follow me. 7,000 that I have chosen. 7,000 that I have elected for salvation to enjoy the benefits and the promises I have given to the nation of Israel. And Paul's utilizing that testimony to say, look, 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 look. Just like in the days of Elijah, when the majority of the Jews rejected God, but there was a remnant that God kept and fulfilled all his promises to, the same thing is going on today. During Paul's day, like today, the majority of Jews reject God. God is keeping for himself a chosen people, an elect people of Jews who he has saved from the beginning, from before the foundation of the world, who do believe in Jesus Christ. Paul's one of those. And in the beginning of the church, who made up the majority of the church? The Jews did. You read Acts, and it's Jews coming to faith. And then there's an initiation of Gentiles coming to faith. So at the beginning of the church, the majority of the church was made up by a small part of the Jews. Now today, the majority of the church is Gentiles, and there's a small part of the church that is Jewish, that believes in Jesus Christ. Paul's pointing to this fact, using the demonstration of Elijah to say, hey, just like it did back then, just like God worked back then, he's working today. He's absolutely faithful. He's fulfilling all of his unconditional promises through that remnant of Jew Jews who believe in me. But there's a major problem with that. Do you see the major problem? Huge problem. So God gives all these unconditional promises to the Jews. And he's saying, hey, I'm keeping that promise, those promises that I gave to the Jews, not with all of them, but with only part of them, just like I did in the Old Testament. There seems to be a little bit of a problem with that. That's like saying, John, that's like saying, John, that's like you promising everyone in the congregation that you're going to pay our monthly cell phone bill for two months. 
You say, yes, finally, something interesting. But anyways, it's like, that's like John, you saying, I'm a, I promise everybody here that I'm going to pay your cell phone bill for the next two months, and then when push comes to shove and the bills start coming in, I only pay two of your bills. And I say, hey, I fulfilled my promises. I made them to all of you, but I fulfilled them with part of you. Does that rub you the wrong way? That rubs me the wrong way. Like, how do you explain that? How do you explain God making unconditional promises to all and only a few receiving? Turn to Romans chapter 2. We have to understand who the promises were given to. Romans chapter 2. Look at verses 28 and 29. Romans chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, it defines who is Jew and who is a recipient of the unconditional promise. It says, For no one is a Jew who is one merely outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. What is that saying? That's saying that in biblical terminology, just because you're born Jewish... Just because you have physical Jewness, if that's a word, it does not mean you are spiritually, in God's eyes, Jew or recipient of the unconditional promises of God. Turn to Romans chapter 9, where we're going to see this again. Romans chapter 9. He's defining who did really God give the unconditional promises to? Romans chapter 9, in verses 4 and 5, he mentions promises given to Israel, and then he defines who those promises go to. Look at verse 6. He says, But it is not as though the word of God has failed. He's just mentioned the promises and the benefits given to the Jews, and he says, Hey, I realize that the majority of Jews are rejecting him, but that doesn't mean God's word has failed. Why? Because you have to understand who a Jew is. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. What does that mean? It means that not everyone who is a Jew physically is a Jew spiritually. Not everyone who is a Jew physically is a recipient of the unconditional promises of God. And Paul goes throughout chapter 9, as we have seen over and over again, to prove this. Ishmael was born a Jew, but he was not a recipient of the promises of God. Esau was born a Jew, but he was not a recipient of the promises of God. Why? Because in order to be a recipient of the promises of God, you are elect and you believed. And if you are not elect or believed, then you are not a recipient of the promises of God in the first place. And Paul here, back in Romans chapter 12, as he's speaking, and he's talking about this topic and Who's going to receive the unconditional promises of God? He's saying, hey, just because you're a Jew by birth doesn't mean you're going to get the unconditional. Doesn't mean the unconditional promises of God were given to you in the first place. It's only those who are elect of God, or as your text says at the end of verse 5, chosen by grace. It's only those who were the promise was given to. And those are the ones through whom the promise is going to be fulfilled. And this now makes sense. So when you see these unconditional promises of God to the Jews, we have to understand that God is not giving unconditional promises to people who are just Jewish because they have parents that are Jews, but he's giving them to these, to those whom he has elect before the foundation of the world, to those who believe in him. He's given all those unconditional promises so when Christ comes along, what happens? Everything functions as it always has. Unconditional promises are not for everybody. They're for those that are chosen by God's grace. They're for those who believe in Jesus Christ. God has fulfilled every single one of his unconditional promises. He promised in regards to the true Jewish and he fulfills in regards to the true Jewish. No promise is broken. Every single one fulfilled. God is trustworthy. And before we move on to the testimony of prophecy, I want us to notice something very, very important. Look at verse 5 again. 
Paul writes, so too at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. What is that about? Paul is making it abundantly clear that he's making it abundantly clear why these Jews are saved and why these Jews are not saved. He's making it so clear. He's saying, hey, it's not because this remnant was somehow better. They did better works and they were approved by God. It's not because this remnant was foreseen in the future and they were just so intuitive when it came to Christ. They trusted in Christ. It's not about them. They're not the reason they're saved. They're chosen by God's amazing grace. They're elect before the foundation of the world. The credit for their salvation, they don't point to themselves and say, I saved, I saved. They say, no, God saved, God saved. He chose me before the foundation of the world. He had this all laid out, all credit due to him. He reinforces that with this talk of grace. God alone gets the credit. It's unmerited favor in every way. God's the reason there was a remnant, and God's the reason there is a remnant, and actually he's the reason there will always be, as we will see next week, a remnant of Jews who believe. So it's with that statement we come to the final testimony. We see the testimony of Elijah. Or excuse me, the testimony, we've seen the testimony of Paul and Elijah. We move to the testimony of prophecy. And once again, he's going to reinforce that God is trustworthy, does what, he do, does what he says he will do every time. Look at verse 7. He says, what then? What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. Now stop right there. Paul knows what he just said in regards to the remnant. And the only reason there is a remnant is because of God's gracious choosing, reference to election. He knows what he's saying is aggravating for most, if not infuriating for most. That it's a hard truth. He knows that. And in response, he says, what then? I love that. That's sort of like him saying, or us saying today, what of it? This is not about your feelings. This is not about my feelings. This is about who God is. This is about the God and his truth, not our truth. So he's like, what then? What of it? I realize this is hard, but this is the way God functions. Yes, yes, Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. Israel was super religious, right, as a majority or a whole. They're all seeking to gain a relationship with God, but how are they seeking it? On their terms, not on God's terms just like the majority of the world today, seeking to have a relationship with God on our terms and not on God's terms. And as a result of not seeking a relationship with God through the prescribed method of believing in Jesus Christ, what happened? They did not gain what they're seeking. They don't gain a relationship with God. Why? Because they don't want a relationship with God on God's terms. They want a relationship with God on their own terms. So they don't get it. Who gets it? It says the elect have obtained it. It says those whom God has changed their heart, those whom God has enabled to see that their way is not the way, but God is the only way, that Jesus is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. He's saying, yes, this is hard. This is so desperately hard because this truth, we can also have a picture of Israel, but also a picture of everyone else. Everyone else and how this salvation process works. She, he even agrees with me. All right? <laughs> so we have this here and he's saying, what of it? We can't get trapped in our feelings. We get trapped on God's truth. We allow him to speak. Yes, Israel, they're wanting a relationship God, with God on their own terms, and they don't get it. The elect, they've been changed by God, so they seek God through relationship with through Jesus Christ, and they do get it. And then he says something really interesting. He says, in contrast to the elect Jews or the remnant of Jews, but the rest of the Jews were hardened. That's really interesting. Due to God's grace, chosen by grace, God opens the eyes of a few, but he doesn't open the eyes of others. And he leaves them where they're at. 
and he hardens them. It's not as though they want to have an appropriate relationship with God God's way. It's they want to have a relationship with God their own way. And they won't get out of it. That's already their own choice. And God's saying, I'm leaving you where you're at. And you're going to get what you deserve. You're going to reap what you have sown. I'm going to harden you. Harden you within your own decision. And that may sound, that may have sounded to the Jew like a new thing, like a surprise. Like all of this was surprising. Like this was a twist in God's mighty plan. That this is all new, but none of it's new. None of it's new. It's all was prophesied. Look at the next verse. Verse 8. As it is written, God gave them, speaking of the unbelieving Jews, a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see, and ears that would not hear, down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. The first prophecy there is actually uh, quoted from two passages of Scripture, Deuteronomy 29 and Isaiah 29. Uh, the second is from Psalm 69. The Deuteronomy prophecy was given 1,400 years before this moment in time. This is not a new twist of God. This is not God deceiving the people of Israel. This is God saying, I'm doing exactly what I said I would do. 1,400-year-old prophecy. And then we have the prophecy of Isaiah, which is approximately 700 years old. We have the prophecy of the, prophecy of the Psalm, which is 500 years before this moment in time when he's communicating this truth in regards to Jesus. None of it's a surprise. It's all the way God said it would happen. God is not deceitful. God is not playing games with our minds. He is absolutely and totally trustworthy. So Paul here is totally decimated. He's totally destroyed. He's totally annihilated. The Jews thought that, hey, since the majority of Jews reject, God is a liar. He's saying, no. Look how God has functioned throughout your entire history. God is trustworthy. We have seen that today in the testimony of Paul, the testimony of Elijah, the testimony of prophecy. He's saying again and again, God is trustworthy. He's not a liar. Look to him. He's the Lord God Almighty who saves. And now we move to application. And the application is throw those beads away. And now you're saying, now John, that really doesn't make sense. Well, listen to this story. Richard Cecil did this once with his daughter. Richard Cecil says, my daughter was playing with a few beads, which seemed to delight her wonderfully. Young girl, she's playing with a few beads and she's having a blast with them. Her soul was absorbed in her beads. To which I said, Richard said, my dear, you have some pretty beads there. She answered, yes, Papa. To which Richard said, and you seem to be vastly pleased with them. And she said, yes, Papa. To which Richard said, well, now throw them into the fire. Then tears started to roll down his daughter's eyes. She looked earnestly, he said, at, her, at him as she thought he ought to have a reason for such a cruel order, for such a cruel sacrifice. To which he said, well, my dear, do as you please, but you know I never told you anything which I did not think would be good for you. She looked at him a few moments longer, and then summoning up all her fortitude with her little chest heaving, she dashed them into the fire. And when she did, Richard walked out of the room. And she was left with her beads in the fire, wondering what was going on. A few days later, a few days later, Richard bought a box full of larger beads, more beautiful beads, and a bucket full of toys. When he returned home, he opened the treasure and set it before his daughter's eyes. 
and he said, she burst into joyful tears. To which he said, those, my child, are yours because you believed me. When I told you it would, be, it would be better for you to throw those other beads into the fire. Now that has brought you this treasure. But now, my dear, remember as long as you live what trust is. I did this to teach you the meaning of trust. You threw your beads away when I bid you because you trusted that I never advised you but for good. Put the same confidence in God. Believe everything that he says in his word. Today's application, you could say it another way, is trust God with the hardship of your life. Trust God with the questions of your life. Trust God with the challenges of your life. I mean, I think we're all holding on to quite a few beads. I think we're all holding on to quite a few beads in which we're saying, I love this, but God is asking me to do this. And he's asking me to throw these beads of security. He's asking me to throw these beads of safety. He's asking me to throw these beads of whatever you want into the fire so I can trust him, trust that he doesn't tell me to do anything that is not ultimately for my benefit and his glory, but everything he tells me is for my benefit and his glory. I think that's especially true today. In light of this passage, we've seen the Jews, and they thought God was a liar, but God is completely trustworthy. And as Paul said before, at the beginning of Romans chapter 10 and the beginning of Romans chapter 9, to 9, he's reaching out to them saying, believe, cast all this foolishness aside and trust in the God who saves. I think that's really applicable today. I think God tells us a lot of things. I think for one, he tells us to reach out to others with the gospel, but we have this bead called self-security. We have this bead called embarrassment that we just don't want to throw into the fire because we don't trust that he can utilize us and give us the great gift of sharing his faith, the seed being planted and salvation happening. I think that we need to, or I need to at least, have beads in my life that I'm holding on to and saying, yeah, I trust God except in this area, except in this area, except in this area. I think we just need to throw them all into the fire. I say, God, I trust you no matter what. What does your word say? Let me do it now. Let me do it now. Just as you have proven yourself trustworthy with the Jews, you are trustworthy with everyone. Today I can trust you in all ways and in all things. Let's pray. Dear God, it's so easy for me, it's so easy in general for us to get up and get caught up in the world's thinking and, and lose the fact that you are holy, holy, holy in the Lord God Almighty and that we can trust you in all things. We can cast away our beads of worry, we can cast our beads away our beads of stress, we can cast away our beads of insecurity, we can cast away our beads of desperation and trust in you. God, we love you. We seek you. We thank you for how you have demonstrated your faithfulness to the Jews and how you throughout Scripture have done this and how you are continually demonstrating your faithfulness today. Help us to trust you and love you. In Jesus' name, amen.